Hello and welcome back. So we're actually going to start looking at operating systems. And to start with, we're going to look at my session is going to be about different features and starting um, booting the operating system. So, you know, this is something we take for granted. We do it every day. Um, you know, it's something that we don't really think about. We just get to our computer, we turn it on. But starting up with the system is actually a very complex process that, as I said, we do take for granted. It's just something we, we've gotten accustomed to and we're used to. So how, do, how does our computer actually start? Well, let's start looking at this process by jumping into the slides. So booting this, um, your computer is a complex process, as I said. And here is actually a screenshot of a BIOS. And the BIOS is actually is used. Um, it's the first part that you see within your computer when you start it up. It, you see all the text scroll by and everything. You can actually enter into your BIOS and configure it. So here's actually a screenshot of a BIOS. And so what the BIOS does is when you first start it up, it does something called a post test. And this is a very important part of um, you know, the process as this detects the hardware of your computer. So the BIOS is actually going out and looking for your hardware that you have. Um, and as well, what the BIOS is doing, it's actually looking for an operating system within your computer, within your hard drive. So your BIOS is searching for this operating system. And eventually, your BIOS will detect this operating system, and it will initialize it. And then once the BIOS initializes your operating system, the OS will actually take over and start um, loading the operating system. So what does your operating system do once it is initialized? You know, again, this is a complex process within the boot process. So we have our BIOS kind of finds our operating system and then detects, detects it, hands off to our operating system, which then takes over and starts loading. So what does our operating system do? Because again, we do take it for granted that it's just there. It's a piece of software that we interact with, but we don't really think about what is it doing. So let's jump into the slides again and look and see what our operating system actually does once um, the BIOS hands off to it. So here is a screenshot of an operating system actually booting. Um, this is a screenshot of the Linux operating system where you could see a lot of different um, text scrolling by as well. So what our operating system does, it actually goes and checks the memory. This is your physical memory of your computer, also known as your, your RAM. So it checks this, uh, make sure everything's OK, that it's usable, um, and that you know there's no issues with it. Next, what happens is our operating system will actually go out and load device drivers. These device drivers are specialized pieces of software that interact with other hardware, such as your video card, your sound card, or even your network interface card. Um, you know, from so it's really any type of device that you have, your operating system is going to load these device drivers so that you can optimally use it. And then finally, once this has completed, we actually have a, our system has successfully started. So this is when we can actually start using um, our operating system after it has successfully booted. And this is, you know, as you see, it is a complex thing from once we hit that power button to the time that you know, we, are, we gain full control of our operating system. It is a very complex thing that we do take for granted. So, you know, there are a couple terms that we should look at and understand. These are key terms. So make sure you do grasp them and understand what they are. And so the first key term about booting is actually going to be warm boot, and the other one is a cold boot. And these are you know, just the different ways of booting your system. And so the first one is we'll look at is the warm boot. And think of this as a system restart. So you just basically say, you know, restart your system. And the reason we call it a warm boot is because the components of the system are warm. They're not, you know, they've been powered on, they're warm, so they've been in use. So a cold boot is actually when, you know, you actually start the computer that has been turned off. So this is when you actually come to your computer and you hit the power button and you start your computer from, you know, from nothing. It's not there. Um, it's not powered on. So you actually power it on. So um, within our operating systems, we do have some common features. So we'll jump into that really quick. Um, 
So common features of an operating system that we do take for granted are, you know, our icons, and we see these on our desktop. Um, you know, we have pointers, which are your mouse pointer, so you can, you know, select and click things. We have different windows, and these are, you know, you see these all the time when you open a new application, you have these new windows. We have menus that provide us functionality within applications. You have dialog boxes that could tell you, you know, different items, you know, click, usually a lot of ones we see is, you know, click OK. Um, we have help menus. We have, you know, gesture controls, so for your track pads. And then we also have files and folders. And these are all common features of all operating systems that we have. So, you know, understand what these are. We interact with our operating systems daily. And as I've mentioned, um, you know, in the, the intro that there are different types of operating systems that we use and interact with. So we'll actually start looking at these and we're gonna look at three different categories of them. So we'll start looking with um, the embedded operating system. So let's jump into the slides and start looking at our categories of operating systems so that we can fully understand, you know, the differences between the three. So the first one, um, is our embedded operating system. And we will talk about features of these and I will provide you with some examples as well. The next one is your network operating system. And finally, we have our standalone operating system. So let's jump into our embedded operating system. So our embedded operating system, and as you see on the slides, operating system is usually abbreviated as OS. So keep that in mind as well. So our embedded operating systems, they need to be compact very efficient, reliable, and basically, you know, they may not run specialized op applications. Reason that they have to be compact, efficient, and reliable is that they actually have very limited hardware. So we don't have, you know, a lot of resources for um, in the computer. So the embedded operating system has very limited hardware, and that's why it needs to be a compact, efficient, and reliable um, operating system. And as well, a lot of times you will see these referred to as a real-time operating system and real-time operating system does get abbreviated as well to RTOS. And a category of these is a mobile operating system is a subcategory, which we looked at, you know, last session talking about different um, mobile applications. So let's look at some examples really quick. As I mentioned, Android last session, iOS, and you can see there are a lot of different um, embedded operating systems that you can, you can see, and you might not know all of these, but they are out there. You have interacted with some of them. Um, you know, you can take other classes here as well, and you get familiar with them, such as um, some of the networking classes will actually use the Cisco iOS, which is a subcategory within, you know, the, um, embedded operating system. So keep that in mind, you know, you don't see these all the time. The ones you're probably most familiar with are from the mobile devices, but there are other ones that you can interact with and everything. So now let's go and look at what a network operating system is, which is the second item in our category. So our network operating systems actually um, basically think of it runs on a server. So we actually connect with these and we use these all the time. Whenever we go out and browse the web, we're actually connecting to a network operating system and that's providing us with the data. So it also helps manage a lot of the different um, items such as you know data, users, you have groups which you can, um, users get put into groups and then it also helps with security. So you know, what does a network operating system really do? Well, it helps to run specialized services. As I kind of mentioned, when we go out onto the web, you know, you're gonna be using a network operating system. So, you know, as a web server, that's a very common one that we see and we interact with daily. Um, so, you know, your network operating system will run a web server. Another one feature of a network operating system that we use all the time as well is a mail server. So this is another one to send and receive email. Our network operating system is handling this for us. And then finally, our DNS server as well is a very important one because this actually, when we go open up a web browser, we type in google.com, we actually go out and talk to a DNS server and the DNS server tells us, hey, this is where google.com lives. 
and it tells us that information. So categories of network operating systems are, well, different examples, sorry, are your Windows Server, you have Linux, you have Unix, and you also have OS X. So these are your examples that you have. And um, one of the most popular I would, network operating systems that you will come in contact with is actually Linux. A lot of services out there use Linux because it is a free and open sourced operating system that you can have a lot of um, configuration and you can do almost everything with it. So keep that in mind that you know a lot of the systems that we use, you might not be familiar with Linux, but a lot of the network operating systems out there are actually running Linux as a network operating system. Finally, the third category that we're going to look at is our standalone operating system. So let's jump back into the slides and start looking at our standalone operating system. So basically, a standalone operating system, think of this as a client OS. So our client operating system is actually going to go out and talk to our networking operating systems. So and with as well with our standalone, this can run user applications. So you can install different applications, such as different web browsers, you know, Firefox, Google Chrome, Opera, you know, different ones as well that you can use. And um, other applications such as Adobe Photoshop, you know, word processing applications. So our standalone operating systems actually help, um, you know, provide us, the users, the ability to do a lot of different things. And as well, um, a lot of times we refer to this as a desktop operating system. And examples um, as well we have are Linux, Windows 7, and Windows 8, so your different flavors of Microsoft Windows, and OS X again. So you can see that you know, we have a lot of different types of operating systems out there, and they aren't all equal. Some do fall under you know, both categories. As you saw, Linux was a network operating system, and it's also a standalone operating system. So some do fall into both categories, and it just depends on how you're using it and how you've configured it. So you know, keep that in mind that we have different types of operating systems, and recall that you know, starting your computer, it is a complex thing. So you know, thanks, and we'll see you next time.